zipper bar Velcros are super tight. Uh, so you got as little slop as possible into the comfort bar. You can feel how these are just have a little bit of slop to them. So you loosen them out, and you use the uh, the soft part of the Velcro to kind of use it as a slip knot as you tighten it around onto itself. And then this one, so you can feel it, it's loose. Whoever put it together didn't take the time to really tighten it down. So you use that as a slip crank it around and you make it as tight as you can physically make it without breaking it. You want those super, super tight. Same with this side. You kind of feel them. Yep, those are a little bit loose. And you can see a little bit of gap there. So we want to tighten this up. Bam. In mind you need to bend over the little teeth around the corners to make it as tight as possible. So you gotta kind of bend it in and massage it a little bit. Make sure it's good and snug and tight. So you got everything good and tight. The uh, things are freaking awesome. Okay, then the next thing, of course, you can check <coughs> your harness, your harness settings. Now, from the factory, we do try and set them kind of for you. Normally, we're gonna set them in the second hook-in point, which is where most people will be. But that, you basically wanna work with me. So when you buy a new unit and you're getting it ready to go fly it, you wanna work with me on where your harness setting is and or remember from class where, where we finally got it to at the end of class. So at the beginning, we're gonna err on the side of having you too far forward. So you're like leaning out of your seat. It's kind of a little uncomfortable because you're kind of leaning forward. But then we want to start working you back to where you get just a little bit, a slight recline to the rear. Just a little bit of a rear uh, recline. Being way too far back is not good. That can be dangerous. So you don't want to err on the side of, you know, just ah, slap it anywhere and be hanging clear flat backwards when you take off. So that would be bad. Upright or too far forwards isn't really going to hurt anything. It's just not as comfortable as it can be. So you want just a nice gentle recline to the rear basically just like that. Is that based so, on weight mostly? It is and where your weight is and so it depends on the person because you might have a guy with long legs and heavy legs and that weight hangs out. I've seen people clear up in you know in the third hook in point that weren't that heavy and it was just that they had a lot of weight in their legs massive legs basically um, or the opposite you could have a guy with a heavy body but really skinny legs or whatever that don't have much weight to them. So the, generally, the lighter people are in the back hole. So this is anywhere from about 100 pounds up to, you know, about 150, 160. By about 170, they're gonna go in the second hole, generally. 170 up to about two, even 240 for the second hole. And then after 240, you might consider the third hole. Um, then, that's the first part. So that's the big adjustment. That's gonna make a big change in where they hang. The next piece is your lumbar supports right here. Uh, these are adjustable in air. If, you know, if you're paying attention, you can pull these forward. Now, personally, I like them all the way to the forward. So I fly second hole with mine all the way to the front of the Velcros. Basically pulled as far forward as you can right at the end of the Velcros. That's where I like it. If you have some lumbar support pulled in, it keeps the back of the harness away from the frame. If you notice, it's not even touching the frame when it's hanging in flight. So it's very, very comfortable. If you do let these all the way out, you can feel more vibration because you can be laying against the frame. So it's nice if you can to have these in, but if you got a really big guy, he's gonna have to let these out. Um, so now this also adjusts where you sit as you pull these forward it scoots you forward in the seat so now your weight's going to go forward and the unit's going to go forward so if you're hanging a little too far back in flight you can take and move your lumbar supports forward a little bit and that'll pull your height up or if you're a little too far up you can pull these out and let them back and that'll change your angle back so you can actually adjust it in flight with those the, uh, and or you adjust it from the ground from here. So we'll generally err and try and get you upright, you know, or a little forward in there somewhere. 
uh, and as our guesstimate. And then after we see you fly a couple of times, well, okay, land, we'll fix your, we'll change your harness and just kind of fine tune it. And then if you happen to remember at the end of class where the nice hook in point for you was, then just remember that when you get your own unit. Um, okay, so we got the hook in, <clears throat> get the right hook in point, adjust the lumbar support for depending on your weight to get your hang angle correct. Then of course you want to check the, uh, and make sure that your harness is all good. As makes logical sense, make sure you don't have any fray or wear marks, you know, or cut harnesses. The, you know, like if you butt land on concrete or something and you drag this along the concrete, you could cut this strap right in two. So just pay attention and don't let your harness be all you know, cut in half. Uh, cool thing about this harness is it's like quadruple redundant. You can cut that strap clean off and it'll still fly just fine because you're hanging from the whole rest of the harness. So the uh, we've had some stupid people actually destroy their harness and continue to fly it and broke their harness in flight and still it was a total non-issue they kept flying just fine able to land safely so it's very nice to have a, a very redundant system where any one piece if one leg strap fails it doesn't matter you're hanging from the other one and then of course you don't even need your leg straps in flight because you're in a bucket seat so if you undo your leg straps in flight it wouldn't really matter if you forget these on launch, that could be an issue. Um, people have actually launched without them and launched just fine and gotten their seat. <laughs> it's been done. It happens. It's a really nice design. It works really well. But obviously, you want to avoid as many issues as you possibly can. Um, to adjust this, this is pretty important. Uh, you want to make sure you push down your seat board and lift this buckle up. At the top of this uh, little T-bar, basically level with the top of the comfort bar, uh, level with it or just a tiny bit below it. So level or a tiny bit below is good. So that one looks a little bit tiny bit below it. Level or a tiny bit below is good. If it's above it, you're, you might not be able to get in your seat and it's going to mess you up because the seat board can get way too high up your back. So this is really critical, but again, we generally set those at the factory to make sure it's right. But it is something you need to pay attention to because they can kind of creep a little bit, you know, and after after you've been flying for a zillion years and stuff like that. So pay attention to that. If you can't get in your seat, check your leg straps. You don't adjust your leg straps. This one you don't really mess with. You set it right there and bam, you leave it there for 98, 99% of all the people. Uh, that one's pretty important. So that's a good piece. <sighs> Next is your shoulder straps, which really, once you get your own unit, you only do this basically once, because once you set your harness, you're good, you know where it's at, you just leave it there. But you get your unit sitting on the ground, flat, just like I'm doing, and Get your leg straps that would be very stupid okay now my shoulder straps the you want just a little bit of play in your shoulder straps so you can fit maybe uh
it's running nice and clean and smooth all the way through the rev band all the way to full throttle right before you launch and then you should be good to go and again don't launch in a manner where if your motor died you're in real trouble so you want to launch where if there was a problem you've got a safe place to glide and land always at every second of every flight no matter what you're doing or where you're at you want to make sure you've got a safe place to glide and land to so it's not a danger, it would only be inconvenient if your motor shuts off and you become a paraglider pilot again. So, but these, that's the most reliable motor on the market and from years and years of experience, we've added all sorts of little details and different configurations. This is very different configuration than the stock motor. There's people out there selling the same engine but it's not the same configuration. It's not the same optimization. It's, you know, you take, <laughs> uh, you get the dyno time and the tuning, the tuning is everything. It's everything. So the tuning that's been done to this motor, this motor makes way more power than the stock motor and it makes it a lot more efficiently and at a lower RPM so the motor runs and long, lasts longer and is more reliable. Lots of little attention to detail on how everything's set up, the fuel system that makes this way more reliable than just a standard unit. Um, if, at, if at any time, several times when you when you, you throttle up with it, and she's bogging on you, mm -hmm. you wait a little bit, okay, you've got the idle throttle and she's bogging on you again, what would you suspect would be the cause of that? <coughs> what would you do? If the engine's bogging on you, yeah. you've got a major issue, something's wrong. Either the tuning's out of whack, or the carburetor's gummed up. So, so she's not getting gas? Or she's not getting spark? Yeah, it's either fuel. It's or probably spark. not spark because usually a coil either works or it doesn't. It's all or nothing. So it's generally not spark. If it's spark, it's usually just dead. You get nothing. Um, so it's usually just a fuel issue. Um, and if you can't figure it out with tuning, you usually would have to replace the carb and just go with a new one. I don't spend too much effort dicking with the carbs. If a carb's frustrating me and giving me trouble and doesn't work perfectly, I just put a brand new carb on it. I, it's not worth messing around for me. How much is that? I want a brand new. And carbs like 200, I want to say 265 in there somewhere. Can you show us briefly brand. how to tune it if necessary? And the carb is modified. It's not just the stock carb. It's a Walbro carb, but if you just buy a Walbro carb, it's not the same. Mm -hmm. There are a ton of little modifications that we do to make it work a lot better and a lot of cool things. Oh, I was going to say, can you show us how to tune it if if necessary the, uh, I mean well, even though the ninja is come tuned so you don't really have to you shouldn't with have to monkey with it yeah but. yeah you shouldn't have to mess with it you take it out of the box you go fly it you actually never mess with the air fuel it has a sticker on there on correct the, well that's your high end so the high end has a sticker right on it so basically it's telling you we've already tuned it and you don't need to mess with it um, the way you would tune it if you had to tune it though <coughs> is you screw your idle set screw all the way in. Idle set screw gets mashed all the way to the stops. Then you basically adjust your idle with the low end, which is a small screw. And so you, you turn the small screw until you get a nice idle to it, which is what I did over there. Um, then once you get a nice idle and you get instant engine response, 
then you would go to full throttle, hold it full throttle, and you turn the high end back and forth and listen for the very highest RPM of the motor. Once you get the very highest RPM of the motor, you would turn it, you would richen it up uh, a little bit to where you don't change the tuning, but you get it on the rich side of running right. And then you're done. All right. And that's it. So basically you just run it full throttle, turn your high end back and forth, and you'll hear the RPMs kind of go up and down on both sides of the maximum, and then you get it right dead center in the middle full throttle, and then you go a little to the rich side. Which is better than lean, people. Lean yeah. and pull stuff up. It's fun. <laughs> it's fun. It's kind of hard to jack up the, the tuning. The, it's, if it's running well, it's good. If, if it's so far out of whack that you would damage the motor, generally it's running like crap. So if it's running like crap, you know there's a major problem. But if it's running good, the odds of you damaging motor you know, it's, it would be very rare to have it. It doesn't make a big difference. It's not like a little bit of tuning is going to give you so much more power. It doesn't make diddly dang dong for difference. Once you get it tuned where it runs well, until it's not running well, the power is not really going to change, if you see what I'm saying. So little tiny little fine adjustments don't make diddly dang dong for difference as far as your power goes. Once you get, you know, once you've run it for a while, you can lean it out just a smidge after you get about 15 hours on it just to get a little more fuel economy, but you know, I wouldn't even ask for that. Unless you buy a crappy motor that only makes half the power, then you want to maximize to the top.